Sound Design. Yeah. All right, so you've done all of the hard work to verify your audio analyzer, and we measured a microphone cable, and we measured an EQ, and now we're gonna measure a speaker in a room. And we're doing this at home because we wanna make sure that we know how to get really good data and know how to take action on it so that we, when we get out into the field, we can um, move really quickly, okay? And we're not just sitting there sort of scratching our heads like wondering, is this working correctly? Like, what does this do? What are our expectations around the analyzer when measuring a speaker in a room? What do we expect to see? Because if I just turn the measurement on right now, it's just gonna be a bunch of crazy lines and I'll be like, ah, I don't know what that is. If this is my first time measuring a speaker, none of it really makes sense. So my suggestion is that we get another trace to compare it to. In this situation, I have a JBL PRX615M right here. Wouldn't it be great if I just had a trace that I could load into Smart and say, here's a JBL PRX615M in a room that someone else has measured that I can compare it to. Sometimes you can do that. If you Google for um, JBL PRX 615M impulse response, sometimes you will find someone out there that has already measured something like this and put it up on a website and you can download it, import that into Smart. Then you have something to look at and say like, okay, this is someone else measured a speaker in a room. Let me see if mine looks like that. And then I have something to compare it to. If you are using Meyer sound speakers, then it's a pretty easy process of opening Map XT, inserting, you know, whatever speaker you're using, put a microphone in front of that, hit predict. And then you have some data here. You can say, okay, this is what this speaker looks like in an anechoic chamber. This isn't what my speaker is going to look like, but it's going to be similar, okay? Uh, I'm going to have this sort of amplitude and I'll have some phase that looks similar to this. Then at least I know I'm on the right track. With MapXT, you can actually export all this stuff and import those traces into Smart and you can have your traces there or Sat Live. But I have all those and I'm gonna give them to you because when I was at Merlin Van Veen's workshop in Banff back in August, another guy in there named Bo did all this work for us and he put it all into a folder and gave it to me. Now I'm gonna share it with you. So this is what that's gonna look like. You've got all of these TRF files. So I'll put a link below this video and you'll just be able to load these TRF files for any speaker that you want. So if we were measuring uh, UPQ, for example, I could just grab this and load it into Smart. And that's actually what I'm gonna do because I looked around for a while, I was not able to find any impulse response for a PRX615M. I did find the Ease data and I was thinking like, maybe I can load this into Ease and then I can export an impulse response and then import that into Smart. I don't think you can do that. If you can do that, let me know how to get Ease data into an impulse response into Smart or something like that. But as far as I can tell, you can't do that. So my suggestion for your workaround is to load any speaker. So in this case, I'm gonna load a UPQ 1P. And the way I did that is just go here, import trace data file. I've got all my Meyer sound traces here. So I picked another speaker that's just another similar speaker with a 15 inch low frequency driver and a high frequency driver. No problem, at least I'll have something compared to. So here's that imported trace. Okay, so maybe I'll have an amplitude kind of like this. Maybe I'll have some phase kind of like this. Okay, great. So I think I'm ready to go. Ah, but what about the delay? What delay do I expect to see in the delay finder here? I have measured my X32 and I know that the X32 takes about 0.85 milliseconds just to get in and out of the console. So let's open up a sticky note and make some notes here. So. 0.85 milliseconds to get through the X32. Then the next thing I need to add is the time of flight. How long is it gonna to take to get from the speaker to the microphone through the air? Well, 
This is about six inches. So I put half a millisecond here because I'm just estimating one millisecond per foot. So six inches is half a foot, so half a millisecond. 0 0.85 plus 0 0.5 is 1.35. So I'm gonna estimate that that delay finder down there is gonna be about 1.35 milliseconds. That's the first thing I'm gonna look at when we load this up. Why do I care about this? Well, if it's something way off, like it's 40 milliseconds or negative 500 milliseconds, then I know that there's a problem and I don't have something set up correctly. So I'm just always sort of thinking quickly, like keeping my eye on this to make sure something's not going wrong and it's not something crazy. Okay, enough preamble, let's actually take the measurement. Okay, so what do we get, 1.85? 1.85, it's pretty close to 1.35. Okay, at least I know I'm not way off. Here in purple is my live trace. And let me save it, let me uh, take the measurement again and actually save the trace so we can look at it with a little bit more ease. And that's hard to see, let's change the color. Info, color, um, green, So not quite the same as a UPQ, right? First of all, I've got the microphone super close and it's right in front of the high frequency driver, right? So it's not gonna be flat because of that. And that may also be doing weird things to the phase reading if I have it so close to the speaker and like really close to one driver. Another thing to keep in mind is that we are comparing a $10,000 speaker in an anechoic chamber to a $500 speaker in a room, right in front of it. All these things to keep in mind, but now I can make some comparisons. Okay, yeah, here's my amplitude trace, sure. Here's my phase trace, and I'm moving it around with the cursor keys, um, just to get, make it a little bit easier to look at. So look, I've got a bunch of extra wraparounds here. Okay, now in these initial steps, I'm not even thinking about why this stuff is happening. I might think about it a little bit, but I'm mostly just observing like, okay, when I measure this speaker in this room at this location with my measurement microphone at this location, what do I see on the graph? Okay, if I move the microphone, then what do I see? So in this video, I just wanna help you take those first steps. So now you can start playing at home and start practicing um, measuring this stuff, looking at the data, and starting to maybe see where some trends are happening. But most importantly, I think the practice here is just learning to read this data. The next things I wanna do are, let's just see what it looks like to move this microphone in the vertical plane, and let's see what happens if we move the microphone farther away. And those will be the just first two steps I'll take with you. Um, so I'll leave, should I leave both of these traces open? Let me close the UPQ trace. We'll just use, leave this first trace open and let's watch the live trace as I move the microphone lower. I need to turn on delay tracking. Here is our new setting. So what's going on in the amplitude here? Well, I can see I have less um, high frequencies. And that makes sense to me because I was right in front of the high frequency driver and now I'm far from it, relatively. Um, what else? What happened here in the phase? This is really weird. If we look at the green trace, I'm flat 
up here in the high end, and if we look at the blue trace, the flat area is here in the low end. So I think the thing we just discovered is that when, I have, when I'm using this delay tracker, it's going to lock on somewhere, and where it locks on, that's where the phase is going to be flat. So to my audio analyzer, this is zero, and everything now that's wrapping around, that's sloping away from it, it's happening in the past. Okay, it's coming in late. But in the blue trace, now my microphone is right in front of the low frequency driver. So to my audio analyzer, this is now zero. And it's locked on here around, uh, what, 600 hertz. Everything sloping up away from it is coming in the future. Negative delay, okay? Everything below it sloping up is in the past. It's coming late. Okay, so this is just one thing I learned from moving the microphone around in the vertical plane, that the delay finder is going to lock onto an area, and then that's what's going to be flat in my phase response here. Let's try moving the microphone farther away and see what that does. All right, let's talk about the time first. So now I move the microphone farther away. So let's just do a quick estimate here. We've got 0 0.85 milliseconds from the X32. Plus, what's our time of flight now? I could get out the measuring tape or my laser distance measure, but let's just say that's about six feet. I'm just gonna eyeball it. So I'm gonna put six milliseconds in here. Time of flight. So that should be then 6.85 milliseconds. This is my estimate for around what the delay locator should be. So what would we get? 5.71 milliseconds. Pretty close, right? Again, just quickly estimating so that I can see is the delay locator set correctly. All right, let me close this. Great, so that's the delay locator. Um, amplitude now, I can see, compared to my previous traces, has kind of balanced out. First of all, it's obviously lower, right, because I moved the microphone farther away and I didn't change my preamp gain, I didn't change the offset here, so lower level, that makes sense, I moved farther away. Um, and the phase is now similar to my very first trace, this guy. And that tells me that the delay locator is now locked on to the high frequencies, right? It's using that as zero time, and now everything below that is arriving later. Okay, um, I don't wanna say anything else about what this is or why or what to do with it. I just want you now to start taking these first steps yourself. Start doing some measurements at home um, and if you're not getting these kinds of results, let me know. If you're having trouble uh, importing some of these Meyer sound traces that I'm gonna give you, um, let me know. If you're not getting these measurements, then stop now, fix this before you move forward because you wanna be able to get into the field and immediately start taking these kind of measurements so that you can see what you're working with and, and start taking action with the data. All right, thanks for sticking with me. I know this was a long one, so let me know how it works out for you. Sound design. Yeah.